Okay guys and girls, welcome to this video which is going to be about how to build a crew in Malifaux. And I don't mean this to be prescriptive in the way that's like, if you're not doing it like this then you're doing it wrong. It's more to discuss and showcase different ways that people approach selecting the group of toy soldiers that you're going to spend the next two hours of your life putting through ferocious imaginary combat to prove who's got the bigger kahunes. The video is going to be aimed at newer players to Malifaux because when, you, when you're first getting started the game can be quite dauntingly complex, and I know from my own experience that I, I had a lot of questions or uncertainties about maybe how was the best way to approach building my crew, and the focus of this video is going to be mainly on how to build crews competitively, and I'm going to assume you know the rules about how to actually play the game. So prior to doing this video I put out a little questionnaire to my gaming group in order to get some idea of how different people approach this, uh, this question. I've condensed the answers into what I consider to be three uh, broad categories for the ways people go about this, and um, I hope you find it helpful, and I mean, there's only so much juice you can squeeze out of this, it isn't really that deep a process, but if I've uh, missed anything then please let me know, or even just uh, put down how you build your crew in the comments. Okay, first concept, building a crew for fun, and uh, I know I said competitive perspective, but there will always be some smug, self-satisfied paladins out there who just can't help themselves fighting this corner and just play with whatever you want, uh, regardless of uh, you know it being the most efficient, effective way of completing their strategies and schemes. And sometimes we will just say, hey, that thing's really cool and I'm going to run it, whatever. So if this is the way you like to go about building your crews, fantastic. You're well on your way up Mount uh, Moral Superiority. But this is something that we all pretty much instinctively know, and is really quite useless for approaching the question of how to build an effective crew. Because, say, for example, for myself, I love building themed crews. But what way can I go about building an effective themed crew? And we end up right back where we started. So, yep, uh, this is an important aspect, uh, but I really just put it in to appease the bunny huggers. So let's move right along into the second concept, the set list. This is essentially where you build your crew without knowing the details of the strategy and uh, schemes or the terrain or the board or who you're fighting, just rock up to the table and throw down. And in my eyes there are two major strengths to this approach. The first, and one that's very dear to my heart, is that you don't have to lug most of your collection around with you on the off chance that this particular model is going to be the right tool for this obscure circumstance. You've got what you've got, you've planned out how it's going to work, and it cuts out a lot of the uh, indecision that would otherwise bog you down. The second being that it's likely that you get to know the uh, particular group of models really well. And so while maybe the faction has a you know even better, more optimised solution for a particular problem, a lot of the time you just don't need that hyper efficiency. And because you know your particular model inside out, you can position it to get the job done anyway. And I like to think that the wrong model in the right position is better than the right model in the wrong position. But there are some nuances within the set list concept, and uh, let's go through them. So firstly we've got the crew box. Particularly relevant for those just starting out, this is the idea that the models in the crew box for a particular master are very often designed to work well together. And I seriously, strongly advise anyone just starting out in this game to just play the crew box and get used to what the models in it do. It will teach you your master's theme and intended playstyle and really just keep you focused on that because it is so easy to spiral out and start grabbing all these different models and you end up spending a ton of money and not playing them enough. And trust me, I speak from experience. So yeah, this is the idea of taking the crew box as a core and just adding one or two models and play that. It can help you get to the grips with the strengths and the weaknesses and how to compensate for them much faster in my opinion. Win some, lose some, but hey, I think you'll be a better player for it in the long run. <laughs> so moving into the holy grail, the all comers list. One magical group of models that can do anything really well, and really there aren't very many in this game, but uh, this one here, it comes pretty close. It's the infamous Joel Henry's Schemes and Stones list, uh, or my interpretation of it. A lot of people put um, On Wings of Darkness on the list instead of Wicked Mistress or Aether Connection. And maybe you put the Retributions on Johan, but ultimately that's a pretty hard crew that can deal with a lot of situations. 
and my analysis of what makes this crew good is that it has a lot of models that do a lot of damage. Nakima's min damage 4, Mr. Graves and Johan and min damage 3, Lilith's min damage 3, and Doppelganger can copy whoever's got the best attack in range. Lilith, Nakima, and Doppelganger can also attack 3 times. Oh, and Johan can flurry as well, so yeah, there's also a lot of AP for getting that damage onto the opponent. And it is just easier to score your victory points when your only opposition are cooling corpses. And what this really comes down to is the ability to put pressure on your opponent, take away their degrees of freedom to score objectives, and force them to commit resources to self-preservation rather than to uh, their schemes and strategies. Not that you can't win a game without killing stuff, but it's not very common that a scheme pool aligns in such a way as to make that a, a you know make the avoidance game a particularly efficient one to play. So it's also important to get synergy within your crew, and we can all tell that uh, certain models work well with other models, but getting the right balance can be a bit tricky. And I think balance is important, because it's really easy to get uh, tunnel vision and focus on making all your models and your crew synergize with each other. And the way I tend to find that it ends up is that one model becomes particularly key, and if you lose it, your whole crew falls apart. But again, I think this crew uh, is a quite a good example of the balance struck right. Lilith can protect beat sticks with her illusionary forests, and draw enemy models into range with her tangle shadows, or if you've got Wicked Mistress with her, um, her lure ability, which allows things like Nakima and Johan to A survive, and B use all of their AP on attacking rather than moving. Then we've got Mr. Graves, who can use Show You the Door to speed up the other models in the crew by pushing them a huge 6 inches, or again chucking enemies into harm's way. Doppelganger can copy that ability and so speed up the crew even more, or mimic Nakima or Johan's relic hammer and add to the heat being put out. There are other synergies in the list like Black Blood and the Primordial's double rush of magic thing with Lilith, but those are the main three, and if, even once you start losing models, Say Graves for example, you've still got Lilith that can move things around, and even Nakima can push stuff with one of her triggers, and you've still got a really hard hitting crew, and you know, etc. If you were to lose the Doppelganger or Johan. But if your intention is to take all comers, you also need to do some scheming. Killing's all well and good, but it doesn't always score you that much victory points by itself. And the key thing is to make sure your scheme running is dependable. If we again take a look at the Neverborn list, we've got these two Terratots, which are really fast, they're very likely to get where you need to be, and Defense 6 usually means your opponent has to commit more resources than they'd like to taking them down. But in case that doesn't work, we've also got the Doppelganger, who would don't mind me, Manip Manipulative and her Camouflage, or whatever it is ability, can be a really slippery customer. Not forgetting what a good scheme runner Lilith is in a pinch. And finally, the, uh, the activations. I tend to find a good rule of thumb is 8 activations. Going low with 6 or 7 tends to mean you have more you know, heavy models, but it's likely they're going to get out positioned, which is usually a big problem. However, going more to like 9 and 10 activations tends to mean you've taken more fragile models that, you'd lo that you lose at a faster rate than you'd like. Now that is quite master and faction dependent, but since you asked for my advice, I reckon 8 is the sweet spot, in many circumstances. Another way of approaching a set list is the toolbox, and this is a way of doing things that I adopt most commonly where I currently am in the game. So the idea here is that for each master, I'll have a crew build for a range of uh, kind of similar strategies and schemes. For example, ones that focus on clustering at a particular part of the board, or others that favour being more spread out in general. So like Turf War and Guard the Stash for clustering, and Reconnoiter and Squatters Rights for spreading. And then I'll roughly allocate stones, soul stones, for the main job roles of models in my crew, as is exampled here. And then I fill it in with models I like, or that fit a theme, or will synergize well for a number of schemes. So it's a bit like an all comers list, except that it's more specialised towards a particular type of scheme pool. The main difference, and why I think of it as a toolbox, is that I'll have some default models in mind, but depending on what particular schemes I actually face, 
the intent is to swap in and out models of the same cost. So for example if my default crew had a Waldgeist, which are pretty good at holding and controlling ground, but the scheme pool I uh, encounter was quite scheme marker heavy, then I might swap it out for a performer, which is a model of the same soulstone cost. It's arguably more focused on that particular scenario's needs. And because I'm replacing light cost with light cost, I don't have to worry about jiggling the rest of the crew around to fit the performer in. It's, it's that kind of idea. And there are some particular abilities that are really powerful in Malifaux. But it tends to be quite hard to get all of them in the same crew. And these are kind of the often the abilities I'm thinking about when I'm swapping in and out models to deal with particular situations or when I'm setting up my, my default crew template. And I've got here a little list of the ones I consider most important. I've probably missed something, but those tend to be pretty key things to think about. So that brings us to the third concept, the tailored list. And I'm not talking about the fact that you know that Mollusk likes playing Kalodi, so you bring lots and lots of blasts, but the idea that you just turn up to a game, find out what scheme strategies are, and then start building your crew. And I'm sure in reality the people who do this already have some intention about what they want to bring, but the mindset for actually what they end up taking is more flexible. It comes down more to just how you're looking at the game more than anything. And I would say this is more of an advanced approach, and not that it's the best by any means, and not that only pro players use this, I mean plenty, plenty of good players take different approaches, but this one tends to uh, require more knowledge of the game to be able to look at the table and, and know just which models will be the best or how to use them in that short space of time you've got before actually putting them down on the board. And also this tends to require quite a sizable collection for a particular faction, which most people don't get until they're reasonably well acquainted with the game. The major strength of doing things this way is that you're building your crew with the most information as to what you're going to be trying to do with them. The drawback being you probably have to cart around the fragile plastic equivalent of a nice holiday. So you've strolled into your gaming locale, struck your most impressive stance and locked eyes with that total hottie mollusk, and he's declared that he's going to be playing Neverborn, and instantly there's a piece of information you can use to start building your crew. Each faction tends to have a certain skew towards a particular way of playing, and it's generally a good idea to build with some sort of counter to that in mind. Not that that's without risk, as each faction has one or two masters that buck the, trend, the general trend, but if you're going against Neverborn, maybe you should invest in some willpower defences just to be on the safe side. Perdita might, for example, consider her aura incestual, uh, aura incestual upgrade as a general crew buff. Or maybe you take a particular model, like Cillarids, if uh, your opponent has declared guild and you're expecting some heavy shooting. And if you look at the terrain and schemes, you might be able to judge which masters in your opponent's faction would excel in this scenario and therefore which ones he's more likely to bring, or perhaps you know about your you know your opponent a little bit better and know they only have access to this, this and this master, and narrow it down and try to build to exploit certain weaknesses based on what you predict. And the flip side of that this I guess is looking at the terrain, the scheme pool and your opponent's faction and deciding which master is going to be the best for you to take. And in the previous concepts we've addressed and talked about that decision is pretty much made by which ones you like or feel most comfortable with, but in this case, certain masters are more tend to be more adept at certain things than others. And maybe I'll do some videos in the future exploring that in more depth. But for now, read Pull My Finger or the forums or play some games and get a sense of what master is good at what kind of thing. So with the privileged information of knowing the scheme pool, you've got the opportunity to spend your points more efficiently dedicating particular models to particular objectives, and this is what I'm kind of uh, going to be talking about in the concept of mini-teams. And here are some examples. Uh, you'll notice the doppelganger features rather prominently because this model is a must-have for any Neverborn player, because it is just so fucking good. This combo can pretty much hold a table half whilst you have scheme runners off doing their job elsewhere. This one is more of a spearhead team for shoving rudely down the opponent's throat, whereas this one is more long-range destruction. And I've got some other ones down there for other masters and factions. Generally three models I tend to find can be really strong, but a bit of an investment 
as I, as I said before, might leave you um, vulnerable to losing your linchpin. And often duo teams seem to be quite efficient. But yeah, it really is the idea of just choosing models for a particular job. Like Lilithu's prime goal is to lure out the enemy master so the Gups could leap in and deliver a message. That kind of thinking. And finally, list tailoring allows you to be able to look at the terrain. And this is super important and I underappreciated this for a long time. But Malifaux is a game of positioning and the terrain dictates where and how you can position. It's super important guys. So let's look at a few examples. If you look at this board you can see it's characterised by these kind of long narrow firing lanes. And thinking of firing lanes might be a useful way to first approach a board. But when you see a board like this you should know that you're in Lilith country. Or Sonia or Rasputin or Zip or any other person um, who can put down line of sight blocking markers. Often big bulky line of sight blocking terrain in the middle of the table favours uh, close combat orientated careers as you can use it to get up up the board without getting the shit shot out of you. So easily, conversely, boards with a more open centre uh, are great for shooting things like um, Envy or for Lily to pulling stuff around. And so whilst that uh, Widow Weaver Corophy combo seemed good for the scheme pool on paper, maybe Doppelganger Lazarus would be more effective. In this game we're playing Guard the Stash, so controlling the centre is going to be pretty important. But I've also got some backfield objectives to get done. So I've taken Kalodi and a battery of Stitch together to hold the centre, which they did rather effectively. And Vasilisa and a Corophy to go all the way around the side as a team together, um, and yeah worked out fairly nicely if I remember. Another game where I think I had Entourage and Breakthrough as my schemes and so the plan here was to get Lilith around this big rock and into the backfield using the rest of my crew just to hold this area and Tangle Shadow teleport Lilith into into this area using something at a key moment. Another game, uh, you know, Stash, Guard the Stash, quite an open centre and this one went quite horribly for me because even though there's cover around the outskirts my opponent has chosen his particular master Perdita in this case and a crew that can blaze away at me as I approach the center and take me apart once I reach it and I'm really just showing you pictures to give you ideas about how boards can look and what kind of terrain setups you can encounter and I thought this, this board was pretty interesting quite a few firing lanes but also quite a lot of cover a somewhat open centre, big enough that say 6 inch synergy bubbles could work without too much risk of line of sight being blocked, some uh, terrain heavy flanks that uh, incorporeal or leaping models could exploit. So yeah, I've got to say for myself it's always surprising how much the table setup can and probably should dictate your crew. And that's about all I got. So hopefully this has shown you some ideas and uh, of course the reality is we probably all mix and match elements from different things I've discussed and play in different ways from game to game but there's some way of looking at it at least. Take care.